get started now in tonight's program, so about natural gas extraction. We kind of ask people to wait on questions because you're going to have a question and, and answer, you know, unless it's like, I don't understand this diagram or something real simple like that. So just kind of wait for the long questions toward the end. Is everybody ready on their, on their, their, their uh, cameras? Okay. So, we can, is this lighting good? Yeah. Okay, so I figured that would help you guys out. So, our, in the back. everyone's, okay, so. <laughs> All right, unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to be clear tonight, as I mentioned, so uh, please come back when it is clear. Um, let's see, I, I do want to mention something really exciting that's going to be happening, and, uh, and George, you might know more facts, so if I say something wrong or I can add to it, go ahead. Uh, we have two, you know, we've had a drought of comments lately, and um, finally now, it looks like we're going to have a good comment in March that's going to be coming by. It might be as bright as hail Bop, or almost close to hail Bop's brightness, and then January 2014, I'm glad you're all sitting down, because the one that might be as bright as a full moon, which will be the best comet in 500 years. So is that accurate, George? Yeah. Okay. Now, this one's going to get so close to the sun, it could just evaporate and nothing will happen. But that, so one of these will probably pan out to be an incredible event, or maybe even both. So, so keep, check us out on the web, get on our email list, check it out. That's going to be some exciting, finally, we got some cool, I mean, the 90s had everything in. It comets crashing into Jupiter, eclipses, everything. The 2000s have been terrible. All right, so I'd like to start off, uh, um, uh, Mr. Cortese is, uh, Matt has um, been, this is the second time doing this uh, program, about two years ago he did it, and um, so he has some updated slides as well, and uh, he started off doing some, a study at Cornell, right? To learn how to actually, the, the first time. Through the Broome County Health Department. So, so he'll he'll fill you in and just kind of save your questions to the end. Thanks a lot for coming. Well, that can give you money's worth, so hopefully you hold your thoughts to the end. March. All right. Uh, before I begin, uh, who has not heard of hydraulic fracture? Anybody here? Okay, I don't think so. All right, here we go. All right, so today I'm going to talk about five of us. Pretty sure you guys know most of that, but uh, can you talk to oh, Sorry, uh, we're going to talk about the Marcellus Shale, um, unconventional versus conventional gas, um, how they do it, an overview of the actual process of unconventional natural gas extraction, uh, what could go wrong, environmental and public health concerns associated with this extraction process. Uh, this includes water quantity and quality concerns, air quality concerns. Uh, chemicals involved in the process to a minor extent. I don't have much detail on this presentation because it would take an entire lecture to do that. Um, some other concerns associated with this and recommendations to protect public health and the environment. Can you guys hear me now? Just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, so the Marcellus Shale. So it's right here in the northeastern United States. It is a middle Devonian aged black shale deposit that's about 390 million years old, which is the middle Devonian period. Um, it lies completely within the northeast of the United States, ranges from West Virginia um, up into the southern tier where we are, actually to a little bit north of us, um, Syracuse level or so. Um, it may be the largest reserve of natural gas in North America in its entirety. Uh, recently there's been obviously intense interest from energy companies to exploit this resource. And like many shales, it formed from organic matter that uh, died and fell to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, during this period. What they may have looked like, as you can see, it correlates with the extent of the shale on the right. Uh, Broome County is here, um, marked by these red arrows. And 390 million years ago, there's a shale see there. And what happened was uh, phytoplankton and other critters essentially died, uh, fell to the bottom of the ocean, formed the sediment layer, and eventually that, there was a fault line there which formed the Appalachian Mountains. It was subducted, compressed, and eventually decayed into oil, and then later on natural gas. So it's a thermogenic natural gas, which means it was formed from tectonic activities. Um, we'll talk about the difference there a little bit between that and biogenic gas. Um, how is unconventional shell gas different from con conventional shell gas? Um, unconventional shell gas operations are larger in scale and they're much uh, more complex. Um, some of these figures are from uh, Professor Tony Ingrafia, who's uh, a professor at Cornell University. He's one of the two experts, I would say, in the, in the nation on hydraulic fracturing techniques. 
Um, so for a typical conventional New York State gas well, um, one pad is usually one well. Uh, it's less than 80,000 gallons of hydrofraction, uh, fr frac fluid, I'm going to say, just for short, um, which means there's roughly uh, less than 80,000 gallons of waste fluid that would come out of those wells. Um, this is traditional uh, gas drilling you may have heard of has been occurring in New York State for over 50 years. Um, so this is the old method. Uh, for an average unconventional shell gas site in Pennsylvania today, uh, which is very active in this process, as I'm sure most of you guys, if not all of you know, um, one well pad is eight or more wells. It could be uh, generally around six to eight. Um, there can be over 80 frac stages, which means that they are able to fracture the well and then refracture it again and again. Um, and if you multiply those together, you get 44 million gallons of fracturing fluid, which equates to millions of gallons of waste fluid that is uh, recovered after this process is complete. Uh, Professor Terry Engelder at Penn State is another uh, industry leader in hydraulic fraction techniques. His estimate for the number of Marcellus wells alone in New York State was between 36,000 and 78,000 wells. Um, around five to 8,000 of those wells would be in Broome County. So we are going to have a lot of activity here if it is allowed. Question. Just so I understand what you're saying, he's saying that's what the future would be if it was allowed to be explored. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's based on like the way they broke down the. Yeah. Uh, so this would mean roughly 360,000 to 780,000. I know it's a large range, but a large number of these frac stages, which are about 500,000 gallons of water uh, per stage of fluid. Uh, the first 1,000 shell gas wells would produce more fluid and more waste than all 50,000 previous gas wells in New York State. To give you just a bit of a perspective there on how much we're talking about here for scale. All right, now the actual process itself, I'm going to talk about horizontal drilling, which is one of the key components to this new technology, or new, I'm sorry, new combination of technologies. Um, so horizontal drilling is a drilling technique where the well bore is turned from a vertical drilling position. Um, they drill down about a mile down, and then they excavate laterally. Um, at the level of the shale, which is about a mile down. Um, it's often used in combination with hydraulic fracturing, which is actually the only way that this process is economically viable. Um, as you can see, this little red box. I have, I have a lot of animations here, just, you know, so just trying to be overwhelmed. Um, okay, and horizontal drilling increases productivity because the well bore actually comes into contact with more of these vertical fractures. Um, in the Marcellus shale, most of the fractures are called joints. Um, or oriented vertically. So you can imagine if you're drilling down to depth and then you start drilling across, these joints in the rock are actually natural conduits for gas collection to migrate up to the surface for the well bore. And that actually increases productivity. So besides, besides actually being able to drill, to drill down, sorry about that. Uh, besides being able to drill down and have less surface impact because you don't need one uh, well head for each one of your wells. You can actually have eight wells on one pad. Um, besides that, you can also collect more gas. Um, horizontal wells require more water than the vertical counterparts, but like I said before, they reduce the number of actual drilling pads you know, on the surface for the same number of wells. Um, these drilling laterals can extend for up to two miles underground, and I've heard that that figure varies, but that's about the ballpark we're talking about right now. I have a question. Yeah. The farther they can drill, does that mean there's more chance of accidents or damage, you know, breakdowns? Uh, or? Potentially. Um, it basically depends on how well the modeling is. So if they if they have a, they're an accurate computer model, then everything should go fine. Um, but there have been instances where there's blowback. Uh, basically where they, they misgauge the pressures that they need. And so there could be problems. That's, that's one of the things with new technologies. That they're, trying, they're trying to work out the, the kinks, I guess. Um, so they're trying to go farther and farther each year with, this, with these laterals. Because the, the farther they go, the more productivity you can have from a single well. And it, it makes sense from a neck on perspective. So that Same. might mean fewer pads. If they can drop, go farther that way, they don't have as many pads above. Correct. Right. Yeah, that's one of the advantages of this. Any other questions on that? The two miles is from the time they turn at Correct. Marcellus. Yeah, that's the actual lateral. So they drill down, and then it's two miles from where they so reach three the three miles depth. total, and roughly. Roughly. The actual level. Yeah. All right, I was going to mention hydraulic fracturing just really quickly. 
Uh, it's a drilling technique where water and additives are pumped under pressure into a completed well. It's used to blast open fractures in fossil fuel bearing rock, such as the Marcellus. Um, it increases the permeability of the gas bearing rock by creating conductive passages, so it, it breaks up the rock so the gas is able to be released and exported to the surface for capture. Um, as I just said, um, it's also, the, there are many names for this, I'm sure you guys have heard of at least some of these, but fracking, well simulation, and frack job, there's like a million different names for these, but uh, if you hear those words, it all means the same thing, it's hydraulic fracturing. And it's one of the key technologies that makes this all cost effective for natural gas companies. Okay, uh, hydraulic fracturing is a complex multi-stage process, I'm going to attempt to walk you through it. Um, the first step is bringing in materials, mostly fresh water, onto the drill pad. Um, this can be done with either a pipeline or with tanker trucks. Um, the potential problem here is that there are hundreds of truckloads of materials for each one of these wells. And each one of these trucks needs to bring in their own fluids. And the water is not, not as much of a hazard besides the truck traffic, the noise, and the pollution, and the potential for accidents. Um, but they're actually, the chemicals they have to truck in are actually very toxic, which I'm going to mention in a little bit. Um, so if there is a spill, this is one way that can happen, just from truck traffic on um, a pipeline burst. Okay, uh, the water is then held in holding ponds or steel containers on the well pad for later use in the operation. So just to give you an idea of what the scale of these things are, um, it's quite a big deal. Okay. Uh, while this equipment and all the materials are being brought on site, uh, the well is actually drilled and perforated, which means that they actually uh, drill, the, drill the well bore and then they insert their casing and then they actually have a little gun they essentially explosive that punctures holes throughout the casing to allow the fluids to permeate through. Um, there are some good videos on YouTube. I didn't want to um, have them goof up in here, but I can, uh, refuse. I can show those to you guys later if you'd like. Um, so after the tests are complete, um, there's an acid treatment which is done to remove some of the particulates that are clogging up the well bore, um, and also to help dissolve some of the drilling muds and other um, pieces of sediment that can clog up the operation. <coughs> and acid treatment involves pumping concentrated hydrochloric acid uh, for calcareous or limestone formations, uh, or hydrofluoric acid for silicate formations. Uh, so it's a really strong acid. Has, has anyone seen the show Breaking Bad in here? Yes. Yeah, if you know, you've seen the hydrofluoric, it's pretty nasty stuff. Um, after acid treatment, a slip water pad, um, which is essentially just a, a treatment with these friction reducing agents, is pumped down to the well. Uh, this allows these fluids to more easily migrate down and reduce the amount of back pressure that you need to actually inject the fluids into the earth. Um, that's key. Some of these friction reducers are potassium chloride, petroleum distillates, and some of these may contain some of the carcinogenic BTEXs that you may have heard of. Um, these are benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylenes. And these are carcinogenic organic compounds. Um, they can also be a polyacrylamide and you know, a bunch of other things they can use for friction reduction. Uh, other additives are also added to control fouling from biological or chemical processes. Uh, fouling is essentially if you have like a slime mold or bacterial growth, iron reducing bacteria, especially or sulfate reducing bacteria, um, down to those depths they can actually grow, proliferate, and clog the well bore. So they have something called biocides or slimicides, pretty fun sounding things, um, are used for this growth um, to kill off the, anything that can grow down there. See what, I thought that hydrochloric acid would kill some of that stuff. I, I would think so too, I guess those things are pretty nasty bugs. Uh, they also use scale inhibitors, corrosion inhibitors, and oxygen scavengers for chemical fouling. So biological fouling is when you have like the, the molds and the bacteria that can grow there. Chemical fouling is essentially rust or any other process that can break down minerals and um, create a deposit that would otherwise clog the well bore. So there's there's strong oxidizing agents that can actually break some of those chemical bonds and allow fluid to flow through. So. Um, and then many of these additives, like I said before, are highly toxic and even in very low <coughs> concentrations. Right, after the slip water pad and other additives are injected, a series of propin stages are initiated. A propin is a material that used to prop open the fractures, hence the name, uh, to increase the fluid conductivity. So essentially this is what you hear, is if you hear 
industry representatives say that they use basically water and sand. This is what they're talking about, it's the, only the prop in stage. So sand is basically used to, after they frack the well, um, they inject the fluid under high pressures to crack the rock. Sand is actually injected in there with it, with a gel, a viscous gel, um, which as you can see in this picture here, is used to migrate up into the well bore and into the fractures that are just formed to prop them open. And this allows the gas, once they withdraw their fluids, after they reduce the pressure of the surface, that's used, and the gas will naturally follow um, out of the, from high pressure in the rock, which is off the image here, into the well bore, and then up to the surface. So it's basically a big straw. What's the amount of pressure that they use to, to drive? Well, <laughs> consider that this is a rock formation that's a mile down, um, and it, which is naturally normally there. Uh, we're talking about thousands of PSI. So it, it's like tens of thousands of PSI, actually. So it's a lot of pressure. And if you've seen some of the pictures of blowouts, you can see that it just shoots out. Well, then if there are fractures in the rock, then that drive, that pressure drive some of those fluids upward? There's a huge controversy about that. If there's any kind of subterranean migration, um, most of the problems from that have not been shown. That's not to say that that can't happen. There is definitely a, me a methane migration problem, and if methane can migrate to the surface from these layers, there's nothing really, there's no really telling, you can't really say, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. You can't deny that some of the chemicals would actually fall, not fall out as well, um, in my opinion. But that has not been studied at all, so that's something that needs to be addressed for sure. Um, okay, you mentioned that, pressure's increased, profit's forced in. Um, this gelant is a complex carbohydrate that is polymerized to form a reversibly viscous gel. I love that sentence, but essentially it's jello. <laughs> and it carries in all the chemicals and sand into, the, into these fractures, and that actually helps increase the amount of pressure that's produced at depth, um, just with the, changing the pH. At the, so you actually you need less pressure at the surface to create that pressure down below. So if you've ever like uh, had ice in a, a coffee can or, or a bottle, screwed it tight, it expands. There you go. Yeah. Are you going to explain how they create that pressure, or is that not part of the discussion? Uh, that's actually just with the use of these pumper trucks. Uh, right here on the top right. So they can produce tens of thousands yeah. of PSI? Yeah. Interesting. With a whole truck dedicated to one well. And that's and it's a lot of things so the they're using there. That's, that's something else I want to get to in that. Does that truck have to run constantly? Yes. Or just at the beginning? Constantly, uh, depending on when they actually fracture well. Um, the well. The fracturing process doesn't take that long. It only takes a matter of, well, for one frack, I should say. Uh, it, it could take a few hours, and then it, they can repeat that if they don't have any production. And then if there is still production, they might do it again anyway to try to increase the yield. So it's a highly variable process. It depends on the geology at the site, but that's what they use to get, build the pressures. <coughs> And I'm going to talk about air pollution as, as a by, uh, side effect of that. Let's say that. Okay, uh, again, this gel is an instant thickener. It's used to uh, increase the pressure in the formation, which allows the rock to crack and you get your gas out. Um, these are composed of modified gar guar gum or modified cellulose. So if people tell you essentially it's just a bunch of sugar, sand, and water, they're partially telling the truth. Um, these other additives are, are actually my, my main concern, as well as what's already naturally down there, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Um, a chemical called a breaker is an oxidizer or a strong acid. Um, this is what I mentioned before. It's used to actually lower the viscosity of the gel um, by breaking these chemical bonds. And this is naturally a toxic chemical. Um, because anything that can oxidize or a strong acid is meant to denature proteins or other bonds, so that's, imagine if that's you, that would be good. Uh, what does natural gas extraction have to do with water? It's probably obvious, but I want to go through it anyway. Um, this, is a little, this is actually Skinny Atlas Lake, it's um, close to where I live now, but that's the drinking water for Skinny Atlas Lake, or for, sorry, for Syracuse, New York. Um, still a little cartoon, if you can read that, it says, look at it this way, the glass is half clean. Natural gas is on the And this, this is clearly, you know, an exaggeration, but just to show you the effect. 
and some of the contaminants are already invisible, which is actually scarier to me. Okay. Um, this is a quote from the U.S. Department of Energy shale gas fire from 2009. It says, shale gas development both requires significant amounts of water and is conducted in proximity to valuable surface and groundwater. So you use a lot of water and it's close to where you need the clean water to be. <coughs> um, it requires the most water of any drilling technique and up to 8 million gallons of fresh water that's per fracturing operation. And again, remember that you can have more than one well per pad. You can have more than one fracturing per well. So it, it's very... It's a very uh, variable process, but there's an awful lot of water they're using here. Uh, Multi-well drilling pads, they can have up to 16 wells. I've heard of, I've heard of even up to 24 wells on the pad now. Uh, it's like experimental things they're doing up in Canada. Um, with minimal pad spacing, that, which would lead to, as you can see in this picture below, this is the Jonah gas field in Wyoming. Um, if this process was unregulated, I doubt this would happen in New York State, but if it did, this is what it would look like. So you can imagine just the cumulative impact of all the water withdrawal and all the um, waste fluid that's produced here. And like I said before, there's multiple frack jobs per well. Um, this is over the well's life. They can use it to increase productivity, or if, they, if it failed the first time, they can try to do it again so it's not a total bust. Um, so this, again, it's not just a one-time thing. It can happen over and over again. And that's highly variable. Uh, water quality. Can also be affected, not just the quantity. Um, so some of these additives these include these acids, surfactants, so scale and corrosion inhibitors, biocides, propens, gel, and breakers, and others. Um, many of which are toxic and present health hazards if they're not properly managed. Uh, flow back or produced water, uh, fluids that can return to the surface after fracturing are extremely salty and may be radioactive. Um, so flow back and produced water, I'm gonna have a full slide on that coming up very shortly. This picture on the bottom right actually shows that uh, from out west. So it's briny and it's radioactive. Uh, fluid recovery is not uncommon for less than 30% of these fluids to actually be recovered. So say you inject 100 gallons, you get maybe 30 gallons back, maybe 20, uh, maybe not at all, maybe 60% is like the high end of what I've heard, 61% actually. So not, all the, not everything you put down there comes back out. Uh, water treatment and flow back, many proposed management plans call for the disposal of these fluids in your everyday municipal water treatment plants. Um, these were not designed to handle salty water or radioactive materials. Um, they used to handle like organic matter that you find in the stream, not salt, which you need to actually um, desalinization plant or tertiary treatment plant. And radioactivity you really can't remove unless you essentially distill your water. So. Even then, it's, it's iffy. Uh, flow back and water treatment. So, flow back is also known as produced water. It's the waste fluid that's returned to the surface after a stage of hydraulic fracturing is completed. So, after they inject the fluids down, they fracture the rock. They release that pressure. Everything that was down there, including the fluids they injected, plus the, the natural briny substance that was down there originally, flows back out of the well, and then gas follows after that. So, this is the flow back part. Uh, produced water contains fracturing fluids and formation water, so these are basically the blinds. Um, of course, these present potentially major health hazards if improperly managed, or if there are accidents like surface spills, natural disasters, or leaks. Um, these brines are here because it was a marine, uh, it, was, it was a shallow sea uh, 490 million years ago, or sorry, 400 million years ago. So it's salty. Um, heavy metals and naturally occurring radioactive materials are called norms. So if you hear the, the phrase norms, that's what that stands for. Naturally occurring radioactive materials. Um, they may also be present in the flow back, which presents further risks. These are typically radium or uranium byproducts. Um, produced water must be properly disposed of to prevent public health problems. I think that kind of goes without saying. And like I said before, um, these treatment plants are not designed to handle this, these loads, especially uh, high dissolved solids. Um, so it's your chlorides, your sodium, your, your dissolved ions, essentially. Um, and the norms, so rejecting compounds with radium and uranium. Uh, one option for disposal of these, instead of um, treating the water treatment plants, is underground injection. 
Um, these may also create longer term health risks because of the upper regulation of seepage through conduits and rock strata. Essentially, if you inject things under high pressure, you, you better hope that your containment system was top notch, and even then it may degrade over time. So if you're dealing with high pressure over long periods of time, erosion is definitely a factor. It's essentially the same problem as uh, getting rid of your nuclear waste, in my opinion. It's basically radioactive, so. Uh, so water concerns. Um, so our biggest concerns are about bromide. This is a quote from uh, Pittsburgh Post Gazette um, in 2011. It says, our biggest concerns are about bromide, which has become a problem over the last six months or so, says Stanley States. He's the water manager with the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, uh, which draws water from the Allegheny River for its 400,000 customers. He also said, trihalomethanes are strictly regu regulated because of the health risks. We've seen levels that are threatening the standards. Mm -hmm. So this, this shows you that in Pittsburgh, they've actually had some problems with bromides, which are some of the naturally occurring brines that occur at that depth. So that means they're drilling close to Pittsburgh? Yeah. Um, and north, north of Pittsburgh as well, and just some of that, the down, they're getting the downstream effects, I would say. And they've noticed this spike after the big gas boom, essentially, in the last five years. Um, Garfield County, uh, this is in Colorado. Um, another quote, this is from the actual public health assessment, or the health assessment from the uh, Colorado School of Public Health. Uh, it says, in Garfield County, accidents and malfunctions have been the most common cause of water contamination from natural gas development and production. However, the Man Creek hydrolo hydrological study indicates some impacts of groundwater, such as, two groundwater, excuse me such as increased levels of chloride and methane from routine natural gas operations. If a domestic water resource is contaminated, remediation is time and cost intensive and may not restore the water resource to quality for domestic use. Essentially what that says to me is once it's gone, it's gone. At least these deep aquifers are not able to be reconditioned for human consumption if they're contaminated with some of these things. Um, Another article, this is actually from the New York Times in the, the Drilling Down series by Ian Urbana. Uh, it says, nor is recycled, eliminated environmental and health, recycling, eliminated environmental and health risks. I can't talk today. Um, some methods can leave behind salts or sludge, highly concentrated with radioactive material and other con contaminants that can be dangerous to people and aquatic life if they get into waterways. So I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but just wanted to show you this is actually happening in other states. Um, so air quality concerns. So you mentioned that if you asked if they were running the compressors night, day, night and day. Yes, they are. Um, so when flowback and other wastes, this is a separate issue with the diesels and all that, another one. Um, when flowback and other wastes is collected in steel tanks, the first batch of gas is either vented to the atmosphere or burned or flared to relieve pressure. So, um, have, how many of you guys have seen flarings? Anybody? Down in Pennsylvania, right? Okay. Yeah. So one time, sounds like a jet. <coughs> yeah, lights up the sky. For yeah, it's, it's a big deal. It, it, you can't miss it if you're driving in one year. Um, but that's what they're doing. They're burning basically some of the initial impurities from that <coughs> gas that they collect. Um, and there's also these things called condensate tanks, which um, the next bullet point says, but they vent out some of the gases as they're purifying the gas for um, exportation. Ex for exporting to pipelines, excuse me. Um, they need to further process this by um, condensing some of the other gases out and then extracting the level they want, so they want the natural gas. Uh, but this process volatilizes um, carcinogenic compounds like these B-Texes, um, generates ground level ozone, and releases natural greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Um, air pollution from heavy diesel, en diesel engine exhaust, as you mentioned before, um, Creates ground level ozone and nitrous oxide compounds. Um, unfortunately, the ground level ozone is especially um, damaging to alfalfa. So, if there any, any of you guys are farmers, then hopefully you're not growing alfalfa if this comes. Uh, pollution, largest from the region's booming natural gas industry, came in the form of ground level ozone, which exceeded healthy levels 11 times since January and caused Wyoming to issue its first ozone alert. Now the ozone threatens to cost the industry and taxpayers millions of dollars to stay within federal clean air laws. Um, this is from an article from the Associated Press 2008 from Wyoming. So. 
All right, so some of the chemical constituents used in a dry fracturing. Uh, according to the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, over 980 chemical constituents used in natural gas extraction are, pro are um, used na nationwide. I'm sorry, I'm kind of moment right now, guys. I just lost it. Um, so many of these chemicals are proprietary, which means that they are not uh, disclosed to anyone, um, except for the state and, f and federal environmental regulators. So the New York State DEC, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, or the EPA. Um, and compound-specific toxicity data are very limited for many chemical additives to fracturing fluids. And this is actually from the um, drafted Supplemental Generic <coughs> Environmental Impact Statement from the DEC. So in the DEC's own words, there's data that's missing on a lot of these compounds. Um, although final concentrations of many solutions used in these uh, fracturing fluids are at or below 1% by volume, uh, many of the compounds are toxic at much more dilute levels. So, um, in this case, uh, Dr. Adam Law, uh, who I know from like, Cornell, actually um, said that many of these chemicals are known to be endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they may have chronic effects on human health in concentrations as low as parts per trillion, um, which is basically one or two mole molecules in a gallon, if you can imagine that. Um, and he's, he's a really good endocrinologist and he's based in the data. So. And if you look up the, the MSDS sheets and like some of the toxicology data, that actually is what is the case. Um, some of these are extremely potent chemicals. Um, another issue is uh, the issue of methane migration. Uh, this is data from a Duke study um, by Osborne et al. Uh, from last year. And what this shows essentially is that if you're farther away from a gas well, um, you have less so this is distance um, to the nearest gas hole like, from the water source they're testing. And on the y-axis here, uh, it shows the methane concentration in the water, so the dissolved methane gas. And this is a, um, from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a peer-reviewed journal. Um, so as you can see, there's an inverse relationship between distance and methane concentration in your water, which basically means the closer you are, the more methane they found um, in the water supply especially in active extraction areas. So with the circles, essentially saying these are all the active sites. They're close to the wells because that's where they're active sites. And they found there's basically a lot of methane in the water. Um, whereas other match sites that are similar, and their geological um, composition and their biological activity, they found there'd be less natural gas or methane in the water supply. So does the same thing happen with vertical drilling? Uh, it can, but not as much, uh, because just the overall impact and the distance is much less. Um, so they're actually, with these laterals, they're going out in two miles in each direction, um, with eight, uh, eight wells per pad. So you can imagine just the cumulative impact of this is a lot more. Um, this, is, this study was actually taken, actually was done in Susquehanna County in Pennsylvania. So if you've heard of DIMIC, um, that's, those are some of the sites that they uh, looked around. Uh, the reference is right there if you would like to look it up. It's on Google for free. Um, anyone can read that. Uh, just briefly, I'm going to touch on non disclosure agreements and local ordinances. Um, so, non disclosure agreements are confidentiality agreements or gag orders, essentially. Uh, they're legally binding agreements between landowners and uh, the natural gas company. Um, they generally they restrict information transfer from parties not bound by the agreement. And this is just from an article from the Portland Standard, which kind of shows the issue, I think, pretty well. Um, this is PA doctors gagged about fracking a lot. So. Uh, the reason I put that there is because combined with the proprietary nature of these fluids, um, these, these non-disclosure agreements um, can really complicate the diagnostic process between a physician and a patient. Um, there have been stories, essentially, this is kind of all the data we have at this, at this point, but um, if a physician sees a patient and they're having neurological defects or other problems, they may not be able to tell them what actually happened or what they were exposed to on their own property because of some of these agreements. And since some of these um, chemical formulas are proprietary, um, the person, the, the landowner may not know themselves, actually. So. But that wouldn't affect a neighbor of the landowner, right? The, if that? the neighbor got sick, they could, 
they could yeah, they, yeah. Have... they could definitely talk okay. um, <laughs> that's a good point and because the impacts are not likely to be felt by just one person um, <laughs> And uh, fearing the health effects of some of these uh, chemicals, essentially, uh, several municipalities have passed local bans on the practice. So uh, I think just the city of Binghamton proper right there, and then the rest of the county has been open. Uh, Tompkins County is banned quite a bit. Uh, it's been a famous case in court right now. Um, they're basically fighting to, sorry, the gas company is actually suing them if um, it's legal to whether they can pass bans or not. So there's a whole issue between local home rule versus the state. Um, that's still evolving as we speak. Uh, Governor Cuomo has said that he will take local um, priorities into consideration, but um, that's about all we have at this point. So. Can you show that last slide, the difference between the green and the blue? I mean, um, Yeah, sorry. Um, the green line here just shows like where it's actually economically available or um, viable. Sorry, can't and uh, it's, it's basically where the shale is the thickest, so it's worth drilling there. Um, but the actual Marcellus Shale extends much farther north. And actually, Marcellus, New York, is around here. And that, that's actually where the, the shale is actually above the surface, and that's where it got its name. Um, it, it starts out at the surface here, and then sinks down about a mile down, and gets thicker um, the farther south. So Broome County and northern Pennsylvania are going to be the epicenters of natural gas extraction that comes into New York. Um, this is all already where they're, where they're drilling the most in Pennsylvania. And the reason for that is because it's thicker um, the farther east you go in the shale. So around this area, so like Wellsville and, and some of the other um, towns farther west, are at a, a, they've been drilling for a lot longer, but their shale is a lot thinner. Um, so there's not going to be quite as much of a rush as there is here. So. What about the Utica? The Utica shale is a, a new play, uh, so to speak. That's it's actually just about as thick and about as productive, and it overlaps with almost as much um, territory as the Marcellus. I didn't cover it just because the Marcellus is the most famous right now. Yeah, they go it farther to the north. Right? Yes, yeah, so Utica is deeper, right? It is deeper. Uh, versus 8,000, 12,000 feet, <clears throat> but it also takes all New York State and into Canada. Yeah. So if we go Utica shale, everyone in New York State gets to have the fun. Yep. Everyone, even the people down the state with the water to the New York City area. Good for fighting this, right? Will they do offshore drilling? Because I understand the Utica goes into the Great Lakes. I don't know. We'll yes, see. they will. I mean, if the money's there, then why wouldn't they? Essentially, if the regulations are favorable for them. <coughs> but I'm, I'm not a policy expert. I work for the natural gas industry. I basically am a, a med student, and I studied this as an intern. So um, I'm just trying to tell you guys as much as I know. Okay, so some other concerns. Uh, this shows the tractor trailer, actually one of those pumper trucks down in Texas that was hit with a flash flood. You can imagine if Sandy rolled through, uh, this could happen. Um, so aesthetics and decreased property values are another concern. Uh, these are just pictures, essentially. I just want to kind of illustrate what this would look like. Um, so if you didn't actually put in your lease where you'd want the well pad on your property, they could put it, basically, as long as you have enough distance, if the tower fell, it wouldn't hit your house. So they can put it as close as that. So it's about maybe 100 feet uh, from your property. They can drill like that. How long are these wells protected? How long would that be there? Highly variable, but it could be a number of years. It could be several years. Um, what they do is they actually fracture the well and they um, grade all the, the earth around the, the well and they put in a, a valve essentially called a Christmas tree. And that's just a, a place where they can collect the, the gas periodically. So it doesn't always look like this, but while they're drilling and while they're fracking, that's what exactly what it looks like. And there's the noise <laughs> and the pollution potentially the entire time. So. And the truck traffic, how long does that go on? As long as they're uh, fracking. <clears throat> when, when they refrack, maybe in a year or so, to try to make them more, more, more productive again, there's no power, you're saying, but there's still the multiple hundred of water if, trucks. And if you're refracking, you, there is going to be the tower. Are there, there are going to be the pumper trucks. There are. There is going to be a oh, lot tower. of the same. Yeah. <coughs> uh, just when the, when they've completed it and the well's productive and they have the, the valve in place, that's the only time that it's just a pipe, essentially. Um, but then again, there are also long-term risks with if there's an improper casing. 
Uh, you could have some blowback, essentially, like, kind of like the Deepwater Horizon in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. If you have a safety equipment failure, that could potentially happen. So remember, there's all these pressures. How old is the oldest? Well, how old is the oldest casing? The oldest casing, like in the, in the country? Yeah. Uh, from the 1950s or before, from the 1940s, actually. Um, but, but like I said before, they did, they were doing vertical drilling wells, and those were much smaller scale. I mean for a frack well. How old is the oldest frack well casing? Oh, you it's mean intact. like per, per well, intact? How, how, long, how long do they last without rupturing or something? That's, that's a great question. I don't think anyone's ever studied that. And it's going to take decades to do now, probably. But I know I do know the shortest lead, and that's been a matter of minutes. So. And, and you talk about the casing being a problem. There's a secondary problem. Abandoned well holes, which are not known about, mm -hmm. where the sprack well that go up to miles, come up those kind of well holes, also hit your aquifer at thousand feet deep. And you just said you can't clean up that thing. No. And those are documented. Uh, there's, a, there's a site uh, by Walter Hang up there in uh, Toxic Targeting, who actually sent out an email recently showing all the sites in Western New York Central where they're documented and just uncapped. Over 5,000. Yeah. yeah. Lots, yeah. yeah so, there, there are a lot of them because back in the day, there, were, there weren't really regulations as to where you could drill. If you, had, if you had land, you could drill a hole and try to find some gas. That's essentially how it was 100 years ago. So yeah, yeah. who so has to pay to cap those wells now? But they didn't put that. And, and who knows if they're even capable? That's another thing. I mean, that, I, that's, there's just a huge number of problems that could potentially happen from this. But no one has really studied it, so you can't really say one way or the other. Um, I mean, you kind of use your common sense that. Nothing's going to last forever, and pressure about a mile down with some of these um, chemical compounds is a long-term risk, unless we find other solutions. So. Did you hear <clears throat> in your research, I heard at a seminar once that once the well is depleted and it's all done and they cap it, that they do cap it, mm -hmm. over time the, the, uh, the gas pressure builds back up again. So a lot of these chemicals that are left in the ground will push their way back up the well. Yep. And the if there's so you've got this possibly holes in this well casing from the fatigue over the years of refracting and refracting and refracting. So that's another potential uh, contamination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I call it a contamination corridor. And you're absolutely right because if you've created a hole in the ground that's a mile down, um, concrete erodes. Um, it could be decades. It could be hundreds of years. We don't know. No one does really, but you're absolutely right. If you have a conduit that you used once, why can't it be used again naturally when you don't want it to be used? So that's a How long does it take for the pressure to build up? They talk about in the hydrocarbons. Honestly, I I don't know. Um, I, I haven't done those calculations. I could get back to you on that though. Uh, property values really decreased all over, or just where like neighbors of the drilling. That don't benefit. I mean, cause I, at a seminar, not a seminar, but a town meeting, a couple of lawyers were saying, "Oh yeah, property values actually increased in Pennsylvania." That, that's a great point as well. I just wanted to show uh, property values values could decrease. Uh, this is just kind of showing the worst case. There are obviously benefits of this whole process. I'm not touching those now. I'm, talk, I'm talking about the risks today. Okay. But decreased property values in the, in the fact that if you have contaminated water or if um, the mineral rights are gone from your property. If you lease the mineral rights and you sell the land without the mineral rights, the property is less valuable. Um, I think what you're referring to is if you sell the mineral rights as well with your property down in Pennsylvania, it's absolutely increasing in value because there's gas there. So, yeah. And you said that on the uh, gas site when it's producing that there's just the Christmas tree? Is that mm -hmm. what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Well, every gas site in Pennsylvania and Susquehanna County has brine tanks, one brine tank per well. So most of them have four wells. There's four brine tanks, which are very large, and they have production units. Every well has a production unit. Every well has a heater. There's dehydrators. I, so there's a whole bunch of things. It looks like a refinery yeah, on the I, site. I, it's I, a full site of uh, three acres or so, and you have a whole complex. So just to, and if you'd like to see it, come to Susquehanna County and you'll see plenty of them. I've, I've seen them. And, and you have I was referring to basically the, the optimum scenario, which of course is going to never happen. Are you, are you, mentioned, you mentioned 
mentioned the flow back, you showed an evaporation pit. Yeah. This occurs in Pennsylvania, I think, some places. Uh, it's only out west, actually. Oh, really? The, yeah, the evaporation pits. Because I was going to make the comment that I guess New York's trying to push forward in tanks, so therefore the evil stuff doesn't get into the air and cause Los Angeles ozone. Like right. Like on Colorado, or Valley's bridge homes are just turned to <laughs> Los Angeles, which is smog. Yeah. And endocrine structure, right? Ozone as well. And radiation. Yep. Okay. Yep, it's all there. Um, <clears throat> Other problems, leaks and mechanical failures and things break. It's just it's part of the job. So you can imagine if this is you know, your radioactive, let's say this is your flowback container, um, like your closed loop pit. You know, the, if this leaks, I mean, who's going to clean that up and who's going to monitor that? Like if it's all in state and there's um, only about a hand, there's a handful of DEC inspectors right now. So in my opinion, regulation is a huge component of this as well. Um, and also methane migration I mentioned before. So out of, has anyone seen gas land here? Mm -hmm. So when the guy lights his uh, water on fire, he's talking about that, that's the methane migration that actually does occur. There's a big debate whether there's a biogenic uh, versus thermogenic. So um, biogenic basically means, say you dig a hole in, the, in your backyard, um, there's some dead stuff that was down there for a while, and you release some local natural gas um, that was down there maybe a couple hundred feet and you're drilling a well. That is, is relatively common, um, but thermogenic shale gas only occurs these very uh, substantial deaths. And that is the kind of gas that is actually um, being found in some of these um, contaminated water wells. So it's not just the, the stuff that you hit in local pockets. People say, um, oh, there's gas in those wells all the time, you can't prove anything. Well, and there are some um, isotopic analyses you can do to distinguish between thermogenic and biogenic methane. So um, they're, they're working on that. There aren't conclusive studies. Um, there's, a, there's a few in the pipeline, but that's what's being done now. Um, and also, obviously, the potential for explosions. We're working with uh, highly volatile compounds here, done in methane gas, natural <laughs> gas, using it to cook with and heat your home. So, yes? What do you think of that movie, Gasland? <laughs> obviously, it's he's showing his own perspective. Um, I, I think most of it is accurate, but I'm not going to go on record and say everything is accurate. I think it was heavily biased. Um, that being said, he does bring up some good points from a public health perspective. So that's, that's my own full disclosure on um, how I feel about this. Uh, some other public health best practices and recommendations. Uh, I would say baseline water testing um, is essential. So testing water wells before drilling begins is essential um, for both liability purposes and health reasons. Uh, testing is ideally done five years before drilling and repeated multiple times annually. Uh, but who's going to have five years in advance of signing a lease to test the water? Um, this is what the level of evidence you would need in court because the burden of proof, unfortunately, is on the landowner um, as of this point. So. Well, another question I guess I would have is are there really mm -hmm. competent testing facilities? Because you've already brought up the fact you don't know what's in this stuff. Now you've got to prove that something that showed up came from this process. I mean, I would wonder that you would even have a, uh, a way to do that sufficiently to stand up, as you say, a legal challenge. 900 chemical. That, that's an ongoing debate as well. And you could basically have to find some of the specific markers that they're only using in the actual hydraulic fracturing process. And that would probably come from a surface bill. Um, Subterranean migration is certainly possible, especially in the long term. But no one's shown that that actually happens in the short term. Uh, I think that's, that's an evolving debate. Um, yeah. It, I don't know how you necessarily prove that without, unless you have like five years of data showing that your water is pristine, 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 chlorides were minimum, and then it skyrockets, you know, a month after they started drilling. And the lab would have to have an incredible bandwidth to be able to detect things. You know, you don't find everything if you're not looking for it. <clears throat> right. Um, I think you'd have to look for some certain markers like pH, um, total dissolved solids, chlorides, sodium, some, the some of the, the basic stuff at least. Uh, yes, sir. There's a lab in Ithaca. Like the fellow who runs it is Planograph, it's a certified yep. lab. That's actually his picture right there, uh, Community right. Science Institute. Okay, yep. he does He does testing on this stuff. You don't have to have leases to test, you can be a neighboring test. I, I, I come from Western New York, I've had my lab tested, my, my property tested by him in case somebody comes. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have a lease to be tested, you can be tested next door. Right. And he tests specifically for identifying the markers associated with, with drilling. And the other thing is, you can find out those chemicals. It's a myth that you can't find out. 
You can do the Freedom of Information Act. Some of us have done it three I've, years I've ago. I've done it as well. And we've gotten it. So people say you don't know it, that's, you can get it. Did, did you do the uh, MSDS request from DEC? Right, from DEC. The, yep, from the DEC. And and we did, got, did you get a whole bunch of like blacked out no, <laughs> no. We, okay, well, we yeah, had somebody in our crew who worked for the so. DEC and he asked the right questions and we got the MDSS all the time. Can you share that? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I made a mistake as well um, as, as an intern basically um, worked for 3000 bucks for two months and did my own research after that and before that but um, yeah I mean I basically had to sift through the internet sift through um, peer reviewed journals um, like Petro One is one of them um, I did do FOIA requests like you said it's tough I mean they're not just giving you all the information you have to go through the steps that you mentioned mm -hmm. to get it so if you're persistent and you know the right people and the right people to say you can absolutely get it what is the impact with all the trees in the northeast east here? There's going to be, have to be a lot of trees with the, each well pad being cut. What's the effect on the carbon dioxide <coughs> level? I haven't studied that, uh, but there was a study out of Cornell uh, by Dr. Ingrafia <coughs> and Dr. Bob Howard. Uh, they measured the basically cumulative methane emissions, um, and they they said the global um, carbon footprint from this process and the actual greenhouse gas potential from hydraulic fracturing. Could exceed the benefit from the cleaner burning um, of the actual natural gas credit coal. Um, that's because of the, the amount of methane you have to release when they flare. Uh, the deforestation, I would say, is certainly part of that equation. Um, I don't know the exact uh, numbers for you, unfortunately, but that is obviously is a huge impact. Isn't it true also that the particulates in natural gas are smaller when it's burned? Um, so it's more apt to cause asthma? I think yes. I heard that somewhere. Yes. Uh, they're super fine uh, particles. And those are less than a tenth of a micron size. So, yeah, really small. Um, as far as asthma, they, it may or may not increase asthma rates. That might be more of a side effect of the benzene, the B-Texas, and the other volatile organics rather than just the natural gas itself. Um, it is mostly carbon dioxide. When you, if you have pure natural gas, it is a cleaner burning fuel. But to get it out of the ground, look what you have to do. Essentially, that's my, my point. I heard there was a study they did once on natural gas for people who had natural gas stoves in their house. And statistically, there was higher incidence of uh, asthma. Yeah, and that's an ongoing debate. There could be um, impurities in the natural gas as well. Uh, you're not going to get everything out necessarily yeah. if you're uh, condensing these gases. So. Yes, sir. Uh, recently, there was news that the um, um, Department of Conservation Commissioner uh, was having a health study done within New York. And what, can you discuss that a little bit, and why was there so much, um, why, why, what's this independent health study that none of the politicians want? In other words, why is... That's my last bullet point here. Okay. <laughs> uh, so another thing I'd recommend, I'm going to get to that, I'm not trying to blow you up. I'm just going to wrap it up nicely. Uh, so I would say 100% closed loop or drilling or pitless drilling systems. So this essentially it's where they use uh, tanks to collect the flow back. Um, this is kind of the best of a bad bunch of options I would say to uh, contain this stuff. But um, it goes in steel tanks, not line pits. So there's no evaporation that occurs. Um, like out west, they allow evaporation pits because it's drier and the water table is much deeper. So the chance of contamination is a little bit less. Obviously less po less uh, populated. Um, this, this practice, this closed loop drilling is becoming more and more common because it allows you to recycle water. So when ro water withdrawal requirements um, become stricter, which is predicted to happen, um, this allows you to recycle some of that water and reuse it um, for more of these fracturing operations. Um, that being said, these are not perfect um, leaks. Things could happen, um, especially if you're trucking things along. Um, if there's a truck accident, then obviously things could be spoke as well. Question. Is there a reason why they don't want to recycle the water? It would just seem to be much more economical. Is it's it because of what's in it that they can't do it? Or? Economical is a relative term. So if the regulations require them to do that, they will yeah. They will do that. That's the only answer. Right but I'm thinking point. even if you don't require it, if i got to bring in 44 million <coughs> gallons of water, that's expensive. I mean, if I don't have to do that. Not necessarily. Actually. Really? If, yeah. It might just be the price of pumping out of the stream if it's not regulated. So. Oh, I see. So you're saying they get it on site. They, they have a limit, yeah. Okay. yeah. Depends on where they are. But in the northeast, there's so much water, you know, they can just use any old stream. 
obviously with the permission of the Susquehanna River Basin Commissioner of Delaware. Mm -hmm. oh, there, there's, limits. Regulatory there's, body have. there's limits that the DEC has on, on how much water you can pump out yes, per but, day. Yes, there is. I was, I was just referring to the fact that um, before you get to that limit, you're essentially pumping it for free. Right. So, and, and all this equipment does cost money, and but they are realizing that it's safer. Um, it's a good PR move for them, and um, you know they don't have to go a million miles. You know they, they can exceed some of these limits uh, for withdrawals because they're recycling a lot of that water. So, a lot of but an amateur stargazer had a telescope since I was seven years old. So. How's it going to impact the clarity of the sky, for the air pollution, the flaring, the light pollution? You're asking great questions. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. It's, um, it's it, not good. It really depends on. It depends on the regulations. It depends on what they're allowed to do or, or not do. Um, if, if they're allowed to do what they did, like out in Wyoming or what they're doing in some places in Texas, it could be very smoggy. It could be Los Angeles asked. So, and those who are astronomers like ourselves, we have dark star parks we go to in Pennsylvania, what's called Cherry Springs, about two and a half hours west of here in South California, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Frack Central, let's um, the, 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 the Parks Department has actually realized this is income for the local area out there, so they actually try to have frackers not flare during the dark windows, which are the two weeks of darkness per month. And the thing is, there's star parks out there where you know, we'll have four or five people bring about several million dollars for telescopes. They'll set up in the field at least once or twice a year, three mm -hmm. times a year. And so they actually try to keep the dark in those periods. But that's certainly an issue for people who are amateur astronomers who like to observe. It, uh, you can certainly Google it, and strong you can actually see through the site for the fracking, you know, like 10 miles away. You see I'll, I'll do that. It's kind of unfortunate. So for this hobby, we need dark skies, <laughs> and uh, this certainly doesn't help that. But the other like to do it this Does this affect the ozone at the higher levels? Mm -hmm. uh, probably not. You mean like in the stratosphere? Yeah. yeah. No. It's just tropospheric. It's actually, it would be fine up there. Um, it would set down on the ground, it's when it causes the problems. So asthma and kills crops, things like that. All right, um, another thing I would say is uh, reduce or eliminate flaring or institute air purification measures to counteract some of those um, side, side effects that you just mentioned. Um, setback distances and secondary con containment. Um, setback distances are just a buffer area between the drilling site and the surface water. Um, those are in place in the DEC um, regulatory document. I believe last time I checked, they're about 50 feet. Um, 50 feet. <laughs> up to 1,000 feet for some other areas, but um, to me, that, that's not adequate. But considering these laterals can go up for two miles, and um, who knows if they're answering where these actually go. And I'm not saying they don't, but I get to see how they regulate that. Um, another thing uh, is secondary containment spill detection methods. These are currently in place on many well pads. Um, along with setbacks, they're important to mitigate contamination risk. So, secondary containment, you can imagine if you had a Coke can inside of like a beaker. Um, if you puncture the Coke can, you still have the beaker to contain everything. Um, this is what they do on site. They actually have like rubber mats. They, they go to great lengths to um, prepare the well pad. But you can't really prepare for a truck spilling over on the rural road um, in some of these compounds. So, um, as we talked about before, the New York State DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, regulates these drilling operations in New York State. Uh, this SGICE, the Supplemental Generic <coughs> Environmental Impact Statement, um, is basically done with this review process. The final public comment period um, just passed this past summer. Um, and they're reviewing it pending a new New York State Department of Health review. Um, Governor Cuomo uh, basically pushed for this. And in my opinion, this is a necessary step. I think someone was, were you, sorry, you mentioning a study? Uh, sorry, did you want to ask that question again? No. Um, forgot. <laughs> forgot I think you were asking about like a, a phantom independent study. Well, you know, it, who is that? Well, uh, why, why, why is everybody so against an independent study that it seems to have to be done by New York State? Uh, whoever, the head doctor, or whoever you want for. I don't know. I'm actually very much in favor for it. Uh, I'm, for my MPhD thesis, I actually want to go to Pennsylvania and gather some of this epidemiological data and just talk to people um, and try to find either correlation or no correlation between some of these sites of drilling and health impacts, so your asthma, your uh, tummy aches, your uh, myalgias, your uh, neuropathy, things like that. But, but, um, 
That's, good. That's a really good question, and I would like to find an answer to that as well, because we need more studies on this. There's just a really lack, a, a tremendous lack of data on this. Do uh, you know they've subpoenaed the guys from Duke who did some of these studies? Gas companies that try I, to put a gag on them and stop them from even releasing any more of this? I believe I didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah. the you know, Scientific American, uh, which was a distillation of the, you know, the other journal you mentioned, this article pointed out that these guys were under subpoena because of the fact that they had released information that, again, was considered proprietary without, you know, getting the approval of the gas companies who would have never given approval. It's, it's, a, it's a, a very political and nasty that, process. Maybe a lot more difficult than you realize. Matt, um, you go to Upstate Medical, so mm -hmm. I, I assume you're in contact with some physicians. Mm -hmm. um, I've attended a lot of Vestal Town board meetings. And one night they had about six or seven positions. One of them was the president of the Broome County, blah, blah, blah. And they seem to be very, very concerned mm -hmm. about the lack of studies with health impacts. Is it Dr. Mahmoud? Huh? No, it's Dr. Heaster. Okay. okay. And, and how can we progress with this without these studies? Now, in your in your experience, is anybody listening to these doctors? Yes, I think that's why this, this new um, DOH recommendation was handed down. And I want to see if it's actually done well and comprehensively. Um, but that's my hope, is that doctors have done enough here to push this. To, you know, let's be a little more cautious. Let's get more data from Pennsylvania. Let's get more data from Wyoming, Colorado, Texas before we allow it here. Um, and I think that's smart, personally. And I'm not going to... I'm always suspicious when, when New York State does its own stuff. So, from what you know with this agency, <laughs> I'm originally from downstate, so I'm suspicious of everybody. But, but um, do you trust this agency to do the study properly? In, in I mean, free. Now? In a vacuum without any political pressure or. <laughs> 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 the world that doesn't exist. That's important. Yeah. So I, the I, I hope so. Um, <coughs> as long as they maintain this as being a transparent process that people have access to the data and people who are interested and curious about it and are actually doing research on it, um, then I think it will work. But if it's not done that way, if, if they allow corruption, uh, no, not Corruption good. in New York? <laughs> <laughs> Are you familiar with, the, with the, what the doctors from Guthrie Clinic have, have proposed and said about, about this whole process? That they're totally against it and a whole bunch of doctors and there's a lot of other doctor communities that have said they're not interested in this. And, and you seem to be implying when it comes. If, I mean, to me, with all the stuff I've read about what some doctors already have said, mm -hmm. I don't know why people aren't saying, don't come. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm I'm kind of because the money is unstoppable. I, I know, but but who's got the courage to say no? You think this organization that does is going to have the courage to say this is not good for the health, safety, and welfare of people in New York? That's the question. Do you think they're going to have the courage to do that? And if the answer is no, so. then we've got to stand up and grassroots and and make it happen. Well, that's why you got to go vote. I think you should be voting for it, honestly. But do you think they're going to have the courage to say this is not safe? I, I can't answer that. I'm not. No. But, but what do you based, think? Based, on my, based on my personal experience and what I've seen, um, I think it would take it would take a really strong leader. I hope Governor Cuomo steps up and says something. But I think it also would hinge on a lot of votes being lost on either on either firm position. You're going to lose a lot of votes. <clears throat> So I'm not going to be up. I'm not going to come out and say that that's going to happen. So you're saying we need a really strong leader, a strong leader and strong grassroots support. Okay. That would make this happen. And how do you propose that we get the medical community to get that grassroots support? I've already started a little bit of work on that, but I mean, if you're interested, um, come talk to me or, or you know, find each other, seek each other out. Sure. Um, so that's that's a great question. I mean, we, we need to. We need to get the facts. I'm, I'm not on one side or the other. Right now, I'm against it because I don't think it's going to be safe um, with, the give, with the current regulatory framework we have. Um, that being said, it might be safe. I just need to see the data. So. Um, I just could make a comment about the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, my brother-in-law, who's uh, got a 
a very strong academic background in uh, uh, fish biology, uh, has worked for DEC for 35 years. Uh, he personally testifies that the uh, scientists there that he's, that he's worked with, that he knows, is a, do a good job and conscientious about their work, take their work very seriously and are concerned about public health and safety. And um, some people seem to treat that rather lightly that folks in DEC are, uh, are, are, are not concerned about public safety, but I, I beg to disagree. I do a few of them. I, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yes. I don't disagree with you at all. I think DEC is doing them as much as they possibly can. Um, I'm going to have to challenge that a little bit. I've met with Jeff, I've met with everyone. Sibley, I've met with the, and I've met with Martins over the past year and a half, and maybe the people working there are, are conscientious and stuff, but the leaders aren't. And the leaders are totally unwilling to take a stand. I'm, I'm sure there's some both. I've met, I've met people that I had that impression of, with, of and people that you said, sort of like your, your brother-in-law, you said? Mm -hmm. Like I've met people like that too, and I think there's there's a good mix of people in um, the DC. I don't think they're often do evil things. I just think that they may be overworked and underpaid, and we'll see what happens. Cool, I'm on fire for a lot of the more experienced ones. Does a DEC? Oh, this is the right question. Does a DEC that it's safe to potentially drill in Broome County, but not around Syracuse in the watershed? That that was a. I believe that was just kind of a rumor that was floating around. They were talking about that like in closed door in you know, closed door meetings, but um, I mean, how did Syracuse get away with that? That's what I'm getting at. I'm not privy to that information. I don't know. But I mean, is it political that Syracuse is allowed to ban the drilling, but not Broome County? Or? Well, uh, that was uh, one of the clauses in the actual new regulatory document that uh, unfiltered water um, sources are exempt from hydraulic fracturing, and that includes the watershed um, that feeds Syracuse, Skinny Ellis Lake, um, and New York City, the Catskill Basin that feeds Newark, because um, they basically don't have to filter the water, and if they lost that um, exemption, essentially, um, that would cost them a fortune. Especially in New York, it's multi multiple billions of dollars per year, but they basically save by having pure unfiltered water from the Catskills. So. But because Broome County has a water treatment plant, that's different? I mean, yes, I, I didn't make that policy. I would not have made that policy. I think if, if you you're basically acknowledging risk, in my opinion, by saying that okay, we're going to exempt these two watersheds, but no one else. I mean, that basically just kind of to me is a half measure. Um, again, this is my own opinion. I'm not trying to sway one way or the other. It's just your own. Um, <coughs> please make your own your own decisions, your own uh, informed decisions. Yeah, I, I don't know why they did that. I think I can answer your question because I also lived in Westchester County where they have the New York City Reservoir system. Could you imagine if a New York City Reservoir got polluted with these kind of chemicals and 10 million people's water was contaminated? But if 50 of us as wells get contaminated, who cares? Right, yeah. But when it's 10 million people, everybody cares. I think that's the half of New York State population. And they got a higher percentage yeah. of lawyers in New York City. Right. 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 They're, they're entitled to a higher percentage of lawyers. Oh, yeah. Question 11. You were talking that obviously it's tough to take care of your water tested. We are in Springfield, Pennsylvania. We have, we've had water tested independently with this at the other. How do you test your air? Uh, and what's the length of time that there could be air pollution? Is it just when they're fracking? Is it just when they're burning off the wells? Is it lasting? Uh, so you have to contact a state certified lab to actually do air. It takes air samples and they analyze them, probably the mass spectrometer or gas chromatograph, um, and just see what other stuff is in there besides your natural air, right? Um, so. So what was the second part of your question? There? I was going to say, is there a window of you know a week within burning off the well, you know, or a month that things are <coughs> so like half worse? Life. Yeah, um, I don't have an exact data with me. I know it's out there somewhere, but I, I believe it's a matter of weeks. Um, but then again, that migrates, so if you right. it could go come from somewhere else if they're not just going right next to you. So. 
Uh, they might have to con uh, continue staying and also need baseline measures. It's the same as water, except the air. You know, in Pennsylvania, I'm in Susquehanna County, we're exposed to the flaring, to the fracking, to the drilling, and there's chemicals. I just had fracking near me the past two weeks, and I'm smelling chemicals on the property, our property. I would like to know whether we can have blood samples taken. We should have baseline blood samples, because how is my blood before the fracking? Now we've been fracked and exposed to the chemicals. I'm breathing that. So it's in my blood. So there should be then baselines for that, and you can see if there's a change. That, that's the kind of study that needs to be done, in my opinion, but I have not seen that done. I got one question. You were doing studies and stuff? I'm, any, I'm actually just planning studies. I've, I've done a, a little bit of work, but I haven't done it. Has anybody taken a look at the coal industry and the oil industry over the past 100 years and kind of looked at the illnesses and stuff like that, associated, health associated with the people in that industry. Absolutely. I mean, all that is, oh, you just have to move it right to here. Hmm. And you know, in those old places that they did it, there were less people living. Where they want to do it, there's a high population. Has anybody kind of done that and built a bridge between what's happened in the fossil fuel industry in the past hundred years from a health standpoint, which, and they can extrapolate that to what could happen now? Has anybody done that? I'm sure people have, and that, that would be actually part of my own thesis that I want to do for my MPH. Um, okay. But I haven't seen that yet. If you, if you find that, I'd like to see it. Well, I'm asking the question, not alone. Yeah, I know. Just, I, I haven't seen it. So that's my answer. So. Thank you for doing the presentation this evening. Very and um, I wanted to just say, do you know, are you aware that there's over 4,000 wells throughout New York State? 11 of them are in Broome County here. <coughs> that are either abandoned or unplugged, mm -hmm. and many of them are leaking and causing contamination. And, um, you know, people need to call the DEC and the governor to let them know that we need those totally remediated and dealt with before we can shoot, remotely look at hydrofracking. And, you know, we don't have the funds. There's only like $200,000 um, right now in the till to remediate them and deal with those things. Um, but. Um, it might cost up to like 200 million. So um, I don't know if people are aware of this, but if you go to toxicstargeting.com, all the data from the DEC, the DEC's data on all the different wells, you can plug in your own address where you live and see um, how close, if there's a well, an abandoned well near your home, and check that out because they're in schoolyards all over the place. It's toxics targeting. That's Walter Hangs. www.toxicstargeting.com. And um, there's a whole, you go to the map there, Marcella Shale, and pu punch in your own address and see if there's abandoned wells. And you can um, go find them and find out. Like one's across the road from me. I live up in Shenango Bridge and I'm going to go investigate it. And it's right behind a schoolyard, a private Christian. Uh, kindergarten through 12 school, and it's right in the back of their yard, so I'm going to go check it out. Have, oh. have you talked to the um, Broome County Health Department yet? About that? I haven't. No, but I'm going to. They, they actually helped update some of their um, GIS systems with some of these sites. So really? Uh, I would maybe ask them some questions, if, and if they don't know the answer right away, they can find out and get back to you. So. Yeah, because we have to deal with them before we even think about hydrofracking, right? If we can't even clean up these messes and abandoned wells and unplugged wells all over, over 4,000 of them, we have to deal with that. Yeah, it, it's certainly a problem, especially if you're, um, if hydrofracking hydro hydro goes through in New York State, and I think someone mentioned it before, but um, old abandoned wells could be another conduit for uh, potential migration from Absolutely. subsurface to the surface. Um, yeah. Again, but that hasn't been conclusively studied. I, I hate being up here and saying, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, but yeah. in all honesty, there's no studies that I can use to, to show it. I don't want to just say something and have it be completely wrong. Sure. Thank you. I sort of back. Yeah. <clears throat> I just want to mention I have some experience with health studies. I've been working with Western Broom Environmental Stakeholder Coalition for the last 10 years. And uh, the mission statement for our group, we worked with the DEC and the DOH on a regular basis. We've been meeting with them for years and targeting different brownfields and contaminated mm -hmm. uh, waste dumps in the area to get them cleaned up. Right now they're working on the idea of burn pit. But referring to the health studies, uh, we, our group advocated for the health study of the IBM, or of the uh, residents of Endicott, you know, from the IBM flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that their study group was a little bit flawed. And the reason I say that 
is that uh, all the people they studied that were in the flu area exposed to the TCE, mm -hmm. uh, we could not get the, D the DOH to go out and track down the people that lived there a long time and that had retired and moved. So I felt it was a, a flawed study, mm -hmm. study group. That's a good point. Um, I'll have to take that into consideration when I play my own study. <laughs> Conversely, they, they included people in the study that recently moved in the area. So, so it did show a high, elevated level, you know, for um, you know, certain cancers and things. Um, but it would be much more telling if they did it correctly. They didn't want to expend the extra capital and expenses and the time to do the study right. Oh, and that's go. our own that's, that's the DOA. Right there. Right. Yeah. Good point. You said that you're looking to get a doctorate working in this particular area. Is there any grant money, you know, coming available? Because obviously you've got this huge block of money coming from the natural gas industry. Is there any offsetting of a tiny amount of money that's coming from, you know, anybody to study this stuff independently so that somebody like yourself and others can be given a fair chance at doing a reasonable I, investigation? That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, no, not right now. There's, there's really not much out there. Um, NIH. I'm trying to work with them a little bit uh, through some of the biotech lens around with the former uh, med school actually. But, um, yeah, I'm working on that. If you don't have any money, then yeah. you've got enough in the world. Yeah. There are some foundations that have given money. The Heinz Foundation has given money. Mm -hmm. The Sandra Stein Grandbar, there's a thing called, I think, the Pace Foundation has given money to different people. So there are foundations out there that are giving money to help people. Not as much as the industry. Well, you're never going to balance it, but at least if you can get some substantial money from like Heinz, I mean, I know that's no, Mrs. Carey, you know, so maybe there could be some money there to, you know, to do some things. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically doing my second year, finishing my second year of med school now, and the next year I'll be doing my MPH. So. <coughs> Good luck. Well, Keep you. going. <coughs> see, see where it goes. I forgot, forgot what you said yeah. in the beginning. Any, any other questions? I mean, I'll be here for a while. <coughs> Well, this study that uh, they want to do, the independent study, are they going to go to other communities where they've had problems and study them, or are they going to somehow correlate to New York State? Um, great question. I, there are people working on this, but I, from what I understand, like, it's kind of just using anecdotal evidence, um, doing the best they can from a piecemeal effort. There's not really been a comprehensive control study widespread national study on this that I've seen. Um, if, there, if there is one that I think we're working on, things like that, but I haven't seen anything done to my satisfaction yet. So. Do you have questions? How many well pads they estimate could be drilled in Broome County, like separate well pads? Uh, several thousand, I think the range was like five to seven thousand. I think that's a good I'll lose so. Just for this county. <laughs> I heard there could be as many as 750,000 in Pennsylvania by the time they're done. So they're, you're just saying the tip of the iceberg down there. Yeah, again, like, this is a, a money-driven process, and this is an industry where they're, they're like any other company. They're trying to, to make a buck. Um, and so they're going to work within the regulatory framework, and however loose or tight that may be, if you say you can have wells with every five inches, I'm sure they'll have wells every five inches. But we'll see. Do you have any thoughts about the brine that they're putting on the road roads here in the wintertime? Yes. <laughs> that's a good question. That's that's something I've heard. Um, and again, I don't want to say that I can confirm that, but um, I do know that some water treatment plants in, in New York State have been taking flow back and produce water, which is that briny um, radionuclear radioactive uh, material. It can be radioactive. Anyway. Um, and that some of those brines are being used for other uses, like like you said, to spread on roads. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe. I don't know that for sure, but I believe. It. I can get if anybody wants the letters that prove that that's happening. Get in touch with me tonight. You can get your emails, and I have access to the actual letters that show where uh, around New York State that the brine has been being spread from the. Um, yeah. You can, I can get them to you. I'm curious as to maybe it's near your home. <laughs> so would the minimum exposure <laughs> risk be the fact that they spray this on the roads, it turns to dust, you drive over it, and you could potentially breathe it in the radioactive isotopes, and it lodges in your lungs, and you could get cancer after a certain amount of years, 15 yeah. years, whatever? 
Yeah, worst case scenario, if the concentration of the particles are enough and it's chronic enough, then yes. So you could have babies breathing this in, they are driving down the road and getting cancer when they're 15 years old, lung cancer. And that is certainly plausible. The only the problem with cancer, um, per se, especially when you're designing a study, is that it's really, really, really hard to identify the exact cause of cancer because there's so many different um, potential exposures you could have had throughout the course of your life. And it's basically just a chronic accumulation of mutations that lead to cancer. Um, so it's really difficult to, to prove unless you have a, a cluster of some like, really strange uh, cancers that you don't normally find in the general population baseline. And that is something that needs to be studied. Have there been any health studies down at Three Mile Island after that accident? I'm sure there have. I haven't studied that at all. Though. And we're lucky enough to have you here, you know, doing this presentation. Again, in your experience, have since since this process is so safe, according to the natural gas companies, how many presentations of theirs have you heard of or gone to? In other words, if it's so safe, why aren't they here <coughs> trying to present it to us at the same time? Actually. Uh, last April, I was at Alfred State at a forum down there, actually, and, and there was a, a gentleman from Chesapeake Energy who spoke um, to a big town hall meeting, like maybe 300 people. And yes, like they had a very polished presentation, and he mentioned the, like numerous safeguards they have, but when I went up there, um, it, it got a little more interesting, I would say, because people were, I guess, noticing like the other potential pathways for contamination that were not mentioned by the safety features he mentioned. So. I would say I've seen that side of it. They do a very good job, their business, and they, they need to do that, and that's part of the game, right? Um, but they did not cover some of the specific uh, flaws I see in regulation and, and controlling some of these potential impacts, like, because they're not required to. That's, that's my interpretation, but it, it, all that costs money. If you're gonna regulate anything and implement safeguards, you generally need regulation to make that happen, um, unless you have a very proactive company that it takes into consideration, but I haven't seen that level of responsibility yet. I just got one comment. I mean, your work is, is, is really good. You're kind of helping teach us, but I invite everybody to kind of take take up their personal position and tell your friends and tell your family and tell everybody if you're not interested in this and use it from a grassroots. New York has the largest grassroots effort against this in the United States right now. And so we need to kind of build on that. The information you share with us when you look at the health thing is going to help us build on that. Because we are getting the governor's attention big time. And that's why he's playing both angles. And so, so I really encourage everybody not to rely on the DEC, rely on the governor. I think we need to rely on grassroots and local, country, local towns to do that. I agree. And like the point of my presentation, I'm sorry if it was completely one-sided. I wanted to just present to you the public health risks. And again, yeah, make your own informed decision. Make, you know, I'm not here to try to t like tell you one way or the other. I'm just trying to tell you decide that this is what we should watch out for in the future. So. Don't apologize. Like, that's what we're here for. I'm not apologizing. I'm just, I was trying to clarify. <laughs> that's what we saw on the website. That's why we're here. Did you research the propane fracking at all? I know that's something to do with their, basically they don't, they don't have as much water. Um, water impacts are obviously minimal, but there's also other things that's more expensive. Um, I haven't done too much work, but I'm just kind of familiar with it. So. Well, propane? Yeah. Well, but as far as the health impacts, it takes, it takes more energy to do propane, and you I mean, you got to you got to generate the propane, to create the exactly. propane. I mean, it's just it's yeah. kind of a conundrum. Yeah. Any inert gas? I mean, well, propane's yeah. not essentially inert. It's inert. Just using oil to get gas. Yeah. Well, I just hear that at least they don't use as much water. And that's, that's more efficient. It's thirty percent more gas out of the when they frack with propane and they can recycle it. Not that I'm a proponent, it still brings up types of materials. There's still a lot of that negative acts. I'd rather see solar and alternative energy. What, what's your opinion on that? I think that's a great point. I think if we can find ways to make this safe, and there's been studies done to show it, I wouldn't oppose it because we do need new energy sources. I obviously agree we need more solar, wind, biofuel, more renewable energy sources than natural gas. The problem is we need to get from gasoline petrol driven economy to completely 100% sustainable renewable and, and natural gas on the national level is being seen as the stopgap. It does reduce emissions about 25% less 
um, and coal and carbon dioxide. Um, except for the fact that it's 80 times more potent as a greenhouse gas if it's emitted than carbon dioxide is um, in the atmosphere. Um, about 20 years versus four for carbon dioxide. Um, so yeah, it's that's a great question. Like it, this is you're talking like a comprehensive energy policy. Um, <coughs> Right now, with natural gas drilling, in my opinion, I don't think it can be safely done because I haven't seen the data. It's like, just like show me the data. You know, like Jerry Maguire's. <laughs> Some countries are totally on wind and solar. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I can say the company, the country of Germany, is is well on its way to using solar as a renewable source. You know, and they're very, I mean, for their whole country, and they're they're ten years ahead of us. We need to kind of look at what they're doing. We can do it. And Germany actually has less. Uh, Solar energy available to it, right. and even here in Binghamton, <laughs> and they're using and they're, using and they're managing it. Yeah, even with those yeah. yeah. suboptimal, you know. Yeah. 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 What we need then is a startup company to mass produce solar panels at a price point that's cheaper than natural gas. It's already there. there. Well, then let's, let's get started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry. If we're, if we're covered with Let it depress you guys too much. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you can write my email up here. It's uh, cortezm at upstate.edu. If you have any questions or if you want to send me any uh, information, I'd be glad to get it. So. And if I don't know the answer, I would be glad to find it for you or, know, or find it for you guys. So. Well, thanks a lot for coming. You came all the way down from Syracuse, right? Yeah. Okay, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. We, we got a little picture of the Andromeda Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs>